Um, so uh, thanks for coming. Cool flyer. Uh, this is fun for Willie and I because uh, Willie and I are buddies and we've done this a lot together. And what this is, is I don't know exactly. It's just a, hopefully a conversation involving you guys. Is this mic working? Yeah. yeah. Okay, it's working a little bit. Yeah. It okay. Works. Good. Good. Um, so uh, basically, we'd just like to have a conversation with you guys rather than just kind of read at you or talk at you. Um, but we could talk amongst ourselves. Um, one of the uh, one thing Willie and I both have in common is that uh, we both kind of uh, tend to write about marginalized characters. Um, we both write stories that are set in the West. Uh, we both come from uh, blue collar families, single mom families, um, where we're not MFA students. We didn't have any um, sort of entree into the academic world, or we just learned what we learned by wanting to read books and, and, and tell stories. And, uh, uh, so it's been really fun for me. For, for, for years I was traveling around and, and booksellers would always ask me, like, you know Willie Blot? And I'd be like, no, you guys got to meet because you're a lot alike. And... Yeah, I mean, Johnny uh, was the first guy I met that was in a, a, an MFA guy, really. And then he just, he, he was, when I asked him, uh, how many books he written, he goes, well, how do I, you mean published? Because I have my stack of, you know, unpublished novels. And, and I was the same way. We were just kind of, it seemed both a, a, a drift and alone in our own little worlds trying to, 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 to write novels because we were in love with the novel. But, uh, you know, both of us uh, weren't academics and, and, and we're kind of alone, in it, which, I, which was really refreshing because you don't meet guys like that every day that, that just slog it out um, and uh, keep trying when they're set alone. So I'm awash in like MFA writers. Jim will appreciate this because it's like, uh, you know, we write literary fiction and there's a shrinking market for this thing. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, there was, in 1920, if something happened in this culture, people were out asking like Fitzgerald and Hemingway what they thought about it. Now they ask Snooky. Do you know what I mean? It's like we have no, we don't really have any social currency anymore. And, and the novel, I mean, part of the reason I feel like American populist fiction is not alive and well it, it, it's not just the readers. Everyone wants to point at uh, uh, digital media and movies and, 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 uh, and all this competition. I don't think that's the whole problem. I think the novel's been part of the problem, too. I feel like modernism happened in the teens of the last century, or two centuries ago now. And um, it was all fine and good. Joyce, I love Joyce. I love, uh, I love Faulkner. I love Virginia Woolf. But they kind of took the novel and sort of marginalized it as, 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 a, as a, you know, they, they undid all the work Charles Dickens did to make it a populist, uh, a populist uh, venture in the first place, and, and then it's just kind of stuck. So for like the last 80 years, we're stuck in this modernism where like, uh, Am I boring you guys yet? Am I making it? Uh, you know no, what I mean? Yeah. I, I'm just getting out why Willie and I jog together. It's because we're just both blue collar kids, that, working class kids that like want to tell stories and share our stories with, I think, with is a growing population of people who want to hear their story reiterated or want to hear a story. They, but what they're seeing more and more of is like great sprawling sentence writers that are indoctrinated at, at MFA programs written by 25 year old kids that don't really have any life experience. Um, and I think that's kind of killing the novel, actually. I can't say this in front of a lot of my friends because they teach for a living, but like, you know, I can say that here. You can say, especially he, after four uh, beers and a shot of tequila, I went ahead and said it. Because I'm a, uh, on record. he's telling me because I'm a house painter and a, kind of a degenerate, <laughs> so he feels comfortable letting his hair down. <laughs> and I was a gardener, I was a landscaper before, you know, so it's like, uh, and we've both just been writing books because, uh, we got to write books. You know what I mean? I wrote eight unpublished novels before anybody published me, and I, it wasn't that I thought the ninth one was a charm. I've got this microphone makes you feel powerful. When you actually have to hold it, you just feel huge. It's like a giant. Um, but just because I had to, you know, I'm biochemically manic, in case you can't notice, I mean, four beers and a shot of tequila, and I'm still like, eh, eh, eh. Um, you know, I, I just, and, and with Willie, I say, well, tell, them how you, tell them how you came to Raymond Carver, and how that changed you. That's a good story. Well, I mean, I, I'd always liked the novel, but that was, uh, um, you know, the only novels around the house were John D. McDonald, which I don't know if you ever read, yeah. Travis McGee novels. Oh, I, I, yeah, had, yeah. My you know, I had the whole, Everyone. I had the whole collection, I had a shrine to them, you did too. All right. And, but I didn't know, but you know, those were 
fantasy novels, really, for me. And uh, I'd, I'd read uh, uh, all the Ian Fleming books and what were around the house. And then first I, I found, uh, just through school, uh, John Steinbeck. And although I was like, I wanted to be like a punk rocker, kind of guy, uh, but I, I was just, I was never really that mad about anything. <laughs> and next, next to my poster of the jam and the clash was John Steinbeck. And Steinbeck was my hero, and he still is. I've always loved Steinbeck, but I thought, I thought of him as, as a god, you know, a, a saint. And I never imagined uh, that, I, that what would I have to offer to, to the novel. And then when I was 20, I, I uh, listened to a, an Australian songwriter named Paul Kelly, who's really, they call him the, the Bob Dylan of Australia. He's an amazing songwriter. And, and he, at the time, uh, was obsessed with Raymond Carver, and he wrote a, a record called So Much Water So Close to Home. Based, and then he wrote a song called Everything's Turning White, based on the, 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 the story So Much Water So Close to Home by Carver. And I loved the song so much that I... I, I saw that it was written or inspired by Raymond Carver's story, and then I discovered Carver, and, and Carver to me was really just like a a weird uncle whispering our life's history in my ear at, at a Christmas party, uh, and it really uh, it changed my whole idea about what writing is. I thought you can write stories about failing people too. You can write about your neighbor. You can write about your family, uh, you can write about people that do nothing. It's Carver's stories, to me, the beauty of them, it was all about guys hanging, like guys that weren't very great men, hanging on by the skin of their teeth. And it, it, it shifted me in a way to give me courage to, to write stories where, where Steinbeck was just too much, because I, I, I held him too high on a pedestal, but, but Carver is hard to hold on a pedestal because he's in the gutter. <laughs> and here's the funny thing about Willie too is that uh, Willie is a romantic. He writes about very, you know, characters living in squalid situations. We both do really. I mean, another thing we have in common is that uh, we both separately written scenes unknowingly. Yours in a song, mine in a novel, where you know characters are just sitting by an empty swimming pool full of rusty bicycles and stuff by a freeway overpass and it's actually a romantic scene. And that's what it really is to be a romantic, actually. Like, w when you read Willie's stuff, it's like, you know, I mean, it's, 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 it's in the Tom Waits zone, but like, there's actually a romantic sensibility about it. It's about people making the best out of their situation. It's, it, 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 and, you know, Dickens was for me what, what uh, uh, Carver was for you. It's different of those two writers sound like on the surface, uh, you know, Dickens was this guy who, you know, I mean, the Victorian novel was all about the landed gentry and, and these, like, really boring romances, and uh, Dickens came along and basically just started writing about the street and started to, you know, he basically changed the novel as we know it into this thing that's, you know, potentially an instrument of social change. It's a, it, it's an educator, and it's, it, it's, it's, it's really something we get to recognize ourselves in for the first time in the 18th century, um, you know, where it's like you got Shakespeare, like I always have this thing, I'm gonna, you know, I apologize, I'm all over the place, but I got this sort of dichotomy with writers, that the, the two writers in English that really more influence every writer, their DNA is in everybody, it's either Shakespeare or Charles Dickens. And like with Shakespeare, I mean, you can go right down the line, you've got your Faulkner, most of your modernists, McCarthy, you go all the way down the road, and in and, and the Steinbeck side you got, or on the Dickens side you got Twain and Steinbeck, and, and, the, and the chief difference being is that like with Shakespeare, Shakespeare was all about writing about big characters exercising their dominion. And, and Dickens was the first person to really start writing about small working class people and how these big people worked on them and how the bigger world worked on them and that just like blew the doors off literature. And it had the same effect that it had Carver had on you. It said somebody's writing my story. Do you know? I mean somebody's writing a story about uh, you know, before that the Victorian novel was just about, you know, and, and Shakespeare for that matter. It's about royalty. And God loved the Bard, I mean he's an amazing writer, but like I I mean ultimately, you know, I want my readership to be just blue collar people. They're just harder to reach. You know? It's just a hard audience to read. I mean, I think for, for me, I always just wanted, like, a, my mom or my brother or me to be the hero in the story. And that just never was ever going to happen in, 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 in the novels I found. And then um, I think 
through Carver, I, I, you know, I, I uh, start becoming more interested in, 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 in books like his and found writers like um, Larry Brown, the great Southern uh, working class writer, um, who I think is just amazing. Another guy who had like five unpublished novels. Yes, exactly. You know. And I mean, for me, I, I, it's just as a fan, I always wanted to, I wanted to read novels about a guy, just, you know, working in a warehouse, and, and, and him being the hero, I mean, so when I started writing, my only interest was about those kind of characters because my whole life I, I was looking for someone to write a book about, about me and my family and, 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 uh, and kind of carry me along through, through where I was growing up. Um, so that, I mean, that's why I've always written in the vein I have. So like for me, I always look at it as an exercise in empathy. Like I mean, I, I really, I, I honestly feel like I've become a more expansive person and a better person through my writing. Like uh, I mean, it's just like the old walk a mile in my shoes. You know, my, my last, the novel I just finished is, is about an 82 year old woman taking an Alaskan cruise. I'm not an 82 year old woman, obviously. But you know what, I mean, I feel like I got to live that. I've got a lot of experience with that. I mean, I lived with my grandmother who was agoraphobic the last two years of her life. My mom is now 82, I deal with her daily. I mean, again, it's a marginalized population. Willie and I tend to write about people who nobody else is writing about. Nobody is writing about an 80-year-old woman. Do you know what I mean? It's not the same thing as, as, as writing about the guy in the warehouse, but it's still a similar MO. It's like writing, writing the stories of the people and wanting, I don't know why a story has to be, uh, romanticized to a level of like we, we want to be inside the rich and famous to like for this to be interesting. I'm fascinated by, I mean one of my favorite books is Last Night at the Lobster by Stuart O'Nan. If anybody's read it, I mean it's it's brilliant. It's just, it, it's it's about the last night of a Red Lobster restaurant in a rust, in a rust belt mall on a snowy night. And the manager, you know, on, on the surface it's like a novel about nothing in a way. But you realize the manager, man, he really, there's just so much at stake here. He's got to tell, like, ten people they're not going to have a job tomorrow. And, like, there's all this, like, there's really all this high stakes and drama that is really more, like, the stuff that we all deal with that's really fascinating. And it doesn't have to have a helicopter chase or anything like that. It's just got to have high stakes. And for me, it was always really, the stakes were never high enough. If I'm reading about, like, you know, you know wealthy aristocrats or royalty, like, even Hamlet, like it's just really hard for me. I mean, I just look at Hamlet and I'm like, all right, dude, you're just this entitled guy and you're a little wishy-washy because you never had to think for yourself. And your soliloquy about suicide's great, but dude, it's like you're not really facing any problems here. I mean, not that, you know, patricide is a problem, but I mean, you know what I'm saying? It's just like, I don't, I don't relate to that. It's like, what are you complaining about? I've sorted rotten tomatoes in 109 degree weather for like 12 hours a day for eight bucks an hour. And not that I want to read a story in real time about that, but like I'm definitely going to relate to a character who's dealt with that reality. It's good to see you, Johnny. It's good to see you. Like, I don't know what we're going. You know, I, this is probably not very cohesive. No, I apologize. It's like this. You want to take it, or we'll just keep going? I'm just so I'm talking about his class. So like maybe you guys can help me figure it out. Maybe this could be part of the conversation. Like I, I want to write this great big class novel, but like I don't even know what class in America is anymore. If you take me back to as recently as 1975, I know what class was. We were very comfortable. I mean, it was basically uh, some brackets with a, a, a household earning income. Uh, like you know what I mean? Now that the indicators have changed, the middle class has totally disappeared. I don't know what it means anymore. We have this term one percenter now, which I think we all know what it means. But everybody is sort of like the bulk of the population is moving down, and and a small per part of the population is moving up. But I'm still trying to get my brain around like what does the new class novel look like? What I I know what it's called already. It's called Mike Munoz Saves the World. Mike Munoz is this uh, Mexican gardener. And, and that's all I know about the novel, but I need your help now to help me figure out, like, what? I mean, I, I can still see some of the class indicators, but what does class in America mean anymore? Thank you. I don't have the answer to that question. But I have a question for you. Okay. Which is, do you start, you know, a book or whatever, a concept, with, with, with just with an idea like that? Like, I want to write a class novel. Yes. Or does it come from a character perspective? Like, I'm just a mean person. I want to kind of flush that life out. And this is what we want, by the way. Jump in any time, you know what I mean? So Willie and I don't have to keep looking at each other like it's a <laughs> um, 
uh, it varies. I mean, usually I come from character. For me, character is story. For me, the whole thing is about, like, there's these two signposts. There's, like, this is the character's reality. This is what they wake up to every day. I mean, there's a set of physical characteristics, a job they have to go to, um, some familiar relationships, some friend relationships, and this is their idealized self. And this is what we all deal with when we wake up daily. Uh, my, the whole penalty of human drama for me is between these two signposts. So as long as I never lose sight of the fact that my character is trying to improve themselves in some small way, I never get lost. I can let them surprise me. I just go all in with my character and let them lead me through this narrative landscape. But the goal being, I want to get a little better. I want to be a little more self-realized. I want to be a better person. And that doesn't, I mean, I wrote a 600-page book with 70 characters, and the hero is probably Craig, and all he really does is quit smoking pot and move to Aberdeen at the end of the book. So it's not life-changing, but for Craig, it's a lot. You know what I mean? And, and so, like, I'm trying to figure out what class in America looks like, because I feel like for 150 years, race has been the fundamental, you know, question of American literature through Twain, through Faulkner, through, I mean, it, up to modern times, and now I feel like it's class. Because now we've, we've, we've leveled some of the racial, we, we, we've, we've achieved some level of racial equality, not nearly enough probably, but like, now I think it becomes more of an economic and class, but I don't know what that looks like. Do you know what I mean? I don't know what that means anymore. I could have written this novel in 1970, and I know I make one character an industrialist and another character, this, but there's all these new considerations. You know, and I don't even know what that looks like, and that's what excites me about you guys giving me ideas. So, <laughs> bring them on. On Downton Abbey, the stories are great with the with the gentry, and they're and they're great with the downstairs help. Yeah, well, which came from Gottsford Park, you know, I mean, like, the, you know. But the, the thing that bugged me about not now I was getting into it, and then the fucking Turkish guy dropped dead in bed, and I said, fuck. I knew it! This is actually just a soap opera. I was kind of getting into it, I liked the social undercurrent, and then when the fucking Turkish Stanley guy fell, died after making love, I'm like, this is actually just a soap opera. Fuck me for wasting 16 hours. <laughs> <laughs> My wife loves it, though. I mean, they know their audience. <laughs> so yeah, please, anything anybody wants to ask anybody, just jump in and say something. Please do that. That's what. My nephew, the MFA, he's changed jobs every year. He's he tried. He wrote a, a few books that never got published. They were kind of unreadable. But the story of what he's done every year for the last. 20 years. It's an interesting story in itself. Good for him. Like he, he's, he's worked. He's uh, he's taught chemistry in Ghana, and he's helped disabled kids in high schools, and he's uh, and he's worked at shows. And every one of those jobs he's enjoyed. And he put it every year he moves on. Well, good. I mean, that should have been his MFA program, right? Don't you think? Yeah, you got to write some things. <laughs> but his real life is probably more interesting. I really have a question for you. So you do music, and you write. Do, does one inform the other, or are they separate tracks? I mean, um, I was never a, a very good student at all. Uh, I, I was one of those guys that uh, really liked school, and, but I wasn't very good at it. I liked sitting in the library. All right. And I liked, uh, <laughs> and I liked uh, trying, but I was never very good at it. So I never assumed, and like I said earlier, I'd never done anything remarkable my family had never done anything remarkable so I never imagined I could uh, um, write stories or novels but I but anybody can be in a band all you need is a couple friends I'm proof <laughs> really talented I was no in many bands the only reason I was in a band is because I really I had a big edge on me always as a kid I was I, I, I was very shy and had a hard time and my brother said well you should just you love music so much you should write songs you know and so and I, I just wanted to be a, a part of it. I wanted to have a you know a flyer on, on on a telephone pole where my band was in. I mean that was really all I wanted. And um and and so I I started uh, in a band uh, just because of that you know and just just because I I was basically just a lonely kid that bought into rock records way more than anybody else. Even my most fanatical rock friends pale compared to me, I mean, I really, I thought of them as, 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 as the Bible, really. It's very foolish. So, uh, so now, so I, I, you know, subjected myself to years of being a really mediocre musician and playing in bars, you know, from 16 on, and, and not doing very well at it, but I just was so in love with it. And then when I 
discovered, like I said earlier, like I, that I could write my own stories, um, that made more sense to me because I'm a work, more of a workhorse, and I love the the craft of a novel. I like the work that goes into it, and the the, the day after day grind. I really actually enjoy that, and um, and more so than being in front of people, and then being in a band. But uh, but being in a band uh, uh, was one of the greatest gifts for me because it it, it, it let me uh, be a part of something, and uh, and, and it, there's camaraderie in being in a band. So really. If my band is doing good, uh, then I'm a musician. And, if, and now, if, if, if my band's doing bad, it's, I'm a writer. <laughs> so it's basically just that. So, so as a fan of Willie's, I mean, you know, I've read all of Willie's books and I love his records. And, and uh, you know, I, like, I think they inform each other quite a bit, too. You know, like, I mean, Northline actually, you know, you made you made a CD that went with that record about Allison and stuff like that. And like, but your songs are like your stories. I think your, your I think your stories are just more, you know, evolved and longer. But like the the, the, the spirit of them is always there. That romance, that uh, the hard luck characters, the working class, it's all there. So if you love his books, you'll love his music. But saying that, the problem with my songwriting is is my is my brother. He was a songwriter too in high school. But my brother wrote songs for whatever girl he was after at the time. And so <laughs> that's like, usually what poets. Yeah, that's like the. And so he would, he would uh, like, he'd have a song called, about like, uh, Janelle. And then he would spend all week writing a song about Janelle, and then she'd come over to our basement. And he'd go, well, I've been just working on this little song about you. And the weird thing about our house is it sunk. And so there was like four inches between the wall and the floor, so you could hear everything coming through. <laughs> and so I'd hear all this. And it was, everything he did was about getting a gal. And God bless him, he's way smarter than me. But when I was in my room at 13, I was like, I'll never write a song just to get a girl. I'm going to write about like working class issues like the jam or the class. And that, that obviously was the biggest mistake in my life. So if any of you think about getting my music, make sure, remember sad sack shit that uh, has no girl. You'll never get a girl listening to Richard. <laughs> You might want to burn your own arms with hot candle wax. Just remember, it's actually romantic. Sometimes you gotta look for the romance. That's the beauty of it, though. It's like it's really easy. There's I read so much dark literature. I mean, I read Jonathan Franzen, and it's like, why? You know what I mean? You're an amazing stylist. You're a great writer, but like, what? What? Why? I just don't care about your characters. You obviously hate them. So why are you sharing them with me in a thousand pages? I just don't fucking care. It doesn't matter how down and out Willie's characters are. I always care for them. They break my heart with their great, with, you know, what did I say on the back of I relish the opportunity to quote myself, because I was probably sober when I wrote this. Uh, you know, I mean, I said that his characters will break your heart with their, uh, with their humanity and grace, and then that's just the truth of it. Like that's what I want to happen to me as a reader. I want it to. I, I want to. I want to sympathize with my characters. I want to love them. I don't want. I don't need. I, if I want social criticism, I can just listen to my interior dialogue because it's really easy. I mean, that's a, that whole idea of like if, if you're going to spend three years in a room with somebody, I, I don't want to. I don't want them to be like a pedophile social. Like a freak that decapitates people, you know. Um, I, I want to love them, and um, or at least understand them, or, or fight with them. God, that's hard. You're harder on friends than I am. Well, no, I just uh, I, I think life's too short, and and I mean, and, and I I've always I mean foolishly maybe, but I've always wanted to write stories for a guy that gets off work, and you're trying to convince him to read a novel instead of turn on the TV and to, to do a, a social experiment or live inside the mind of someone you don't want to be around um, doesn't interest me. Uh, the fight uh, interests me. And, and so I've always tried to write short novels that, that maybe a guy gets off work and he'll get sucked in so hard and so intense that maybe he, he won't turn on the TV. Now granted, this was all just me trying to get drinking buddies of mine to, to read novels that I thought were cool and they never would. Uh, but, so I've never had an understanding of writing novels that, that, that can't get you on a really root level that maybe could get you to, to read a novel uh, after a hard day's work. I think that's right. Do you 
find that... It's kind of impossible not to crush on him really after all. <laughs> He's so humble. I'm as natural as they come, but even I, I know it makes him uncomfortable. He's just so, you know what I mean? He's just so one of the guys, man. You find that working class novels are harder to publish, to get a publisher in these days. But they might be harder to sell. I don't know if they're harder to find a publisher. I mean, I actually think the industry is looking for stuff that's not, you know, I mean, like so much MFA fiction is just not really that interesting. I mean, in terms of, I mean, it's all about dynamic and using the fishbowl lens. And it's about, it's, it's much more of a crafty proposition. Uh, I think that, I think that the industry is hungry for it. I think it is becomes, I think it's maybe harder to target an audience a little bit. I don't know because, uh, you know, I don't know. I mean, obviously, neither of us really think about it. You know what I mean? I we should get think lucky. about that stuff, but I no, you, you know what? I'm, I'm you the kind of guy that thinks about that stuff like while well, after it's come out, and I'm like, yeah, maybe I shouldn't have done that. Maybe I, I shouldn't have gone down that low. But geez, I don't know. I mean, uh, besides Steinbeck, most of my favorite writers have never did very well. So I'm not the right guy to ask. Uh, I just know, I've always known what kind of books I wanted to find. And I've always been really adamant about trying to find the books that, that meant something to me, and I want to do the same. I mean, there's a book called Fat City by a guy named Leonard Garber. They made a really great movie well, out of it. The Boxer one he gave me. Yeah, yeah. But, but John Houston made a movie of it. And I don't know if it did anything, but I read it every year. And uh, uh, William Kennedy's Iron Weed. Uh, I think it's one of the great, great novels, and I read that every year. I could care less if it was a bestseller or not. It meant a lot to me. Um, so I, I have no idea if, if, if those kind of stories uh, sell, but I, I do know they, they do make a difference to somebody. I mean, those kind of novels always made a difference to me, even though I'm just one guy. You know what I mean? I think about the reader constantly, but like when I think about the reader, I'm not thinking about the, I'm not thinking about the 25 to 65 year old female, which is the money demo in publishing. That's the only people that read literary fiction. I mean, guys don't read fiction. I mean, except for Johns, the Johns, and a few people here. This is actually a really good show. Trust me. As a guy who's been to a million book clubs, there's usually like one guy, and he's got a couple of dog leashes in the foyer, and he's like, "Dude, I'm just trying to get out of here." But like, uh, so you don't think about that, but you, you got to think about the reader, you know what I mean? And the reader is you, what, what you get off on. So like for me, it's like, uh, I always think of what Fred Astaire said about Ginger Rogers. It's like the reader has to do everything I do backwards and heels. So like I'm, I'm very aware, the reader is just me. You know, that, that reader, my idealized reader has the same facility as I do have a reader. They make connections at the level I make connections at. And the thing about commercial fiction is that, you know, sometimes there's an effort to dumb it down to where like don't give the reader too much credit. And literary fiction is as guilty of this as any anybody, you know what I mean? Like so often in literary fiction there's this cult of the, the, the you know, the author. You know what I mean? The, I, you know, the, the, the novel is dying because of the author. Do you know what I mean? I mean, and, and Faulkner's as guilty as anybody else. But Faulkner, to his credit, when he was being, you know, obtuse or, or obfuscating his own work, that was at a time where it made sense, you know? I mean, modernism was happening. It was just the times in this country. It was happening in architecture. It was happening in visual arts. It was happening everywhere. Well, everybody else moved on, and then the novel just got stuck there for like a hundred fucking years. And then at some point, they started putting post in front of modern. And now it's postmodern, but like basically the bottom line is is that the populist novel, the, the novel that was designed to like try to speak to as many people as possible uh, and challenge them and, and bring up relevant uh, you know relevant issues in their life or social problems or whatever whatever melee you choose, kind of went away and it became about like the author showing off, like right? I mean. Somebody? Anybody? I know Claire, Claire and Bruce are both nodding. You know what I mean? I mean, how many novels? I mean, I get so much stuff across my desk, and I never have the heart to tell the writer, but I'm just like, okay, you wrote this. But it doesn't feel like you had to write it. There's no sense of urgency. It's like somebody taught you to write. Somebody taught you some shortcuts. They taught you craft. They taught you uh, uh, principles about uh, Aristotelian, uh, uh, Aristotelian dramatics. 
You understand the three-act structure. You understand elevating stakes. But why did you write it? Why did it have to be written? Where's that sense of urgency? And the people that don't go to school and don't become aware of that just kind of naturally approach writing at that point. Willie started writing, like he said, because to, 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 he wanted somebody to tell his stories. And, and when he found somebody that was actually doing that, it gave him the courage to do that. And um, if, if we had more of that in the novel, I don't think it would be doing so bad. And it is doing bad. Like every year is like the worst year for literary fiction. Every year it's worse than the last year. And that's been going on since 1990. You know, it's like... 20 years ago, we would have been in the arena. <laughs> and this is better than either of us expected. We were just like, well, we were counting the librarians. We were counting others. You know, we were counting like, yeah, well, I don't know who's one. And I guess I'm a person, too, so that's fine. <laughs> but literally, man, in the 70s, when the Jewish-American male writer was alive and well in the 60s, I mean, you know, you commanded an audience or something. But like... Part of the problem is the writer's fault, is what I'm saying. It's not just the consumer's fault or the, you know? Part of the problem is the art itself has gotten away from trying to be a great communicator and become like a, like more like a, what do you call it? Like the journeyman and the, whatever. I'll shut up now. No, no, I, somebody has a really good question. Here, give me a beer, please. What do you want? Uh, Ale? Ale? What do you have in the cold? Oh, cold. I'll pay you. Yeah, I'll pay you. Drink order. Yeah, yeah. Um, you guys have alluded here and there to uh, shrinking readership, but there's no shortage of people. So how do you convince people that your work there is buying attention and the money that, without sounding like you know that obnoxious guy in the bar who's you know trying to get you to listen to Booster D but like who likes or something? Hey, what's wrong with that guy? Was <laughs> that one of the great screaming drummers? We played with you. Were we hanging out the other night? <laughs> um, you know, I mean, I mean, I, to be honest, you know, I've spent most of my life trying to get my drinking buddies to read novels, and I, and, and now I'm on to audiobooks. I, 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 I illegally uh, burn uh, Dennis Johnson's Jesus' Son over and over, and just did, like a story at a time to give to friends of mine and say, hey, like, you got a 45 minute commute. This is this. Um, I tried with the, that's why I've been such a fan of like Jim Thompson, uh, the noir guys like uh, Williford, David Goodis, because they're really short, they're written with blood, they're really intense, um, and I've always, I give those as presents. I don't, if, if, I can only speak to like working class kind of guys to try to get them to read, and if you can't get them, you can't get them. I mean, well, what I try do you think the hitch is? I mean, what, what's their reluctance? What's what you perceive? TV, movies, distractions, uh, and, and, and I think, um, you know, with band, like I could play, I could talk to you for 20 minutes, get an idea of what you like, but a lot of guys have never really read a novel, and so you, you have no frame of reference, and the novel's way more personal than, than a record in a lot of ways, and it, you know, you know, like I, I could talk to you, and you, I mean, maybe your reference is REO Speedwagon, is the only band you ever liked, well, at least I have something. But a lot of guys never really read novels. And so, strictly speaking, they're like guys that haven't read novels. And so it's harder to know what really makes them tick. And so you don't know if you should get, like, George Pelicanos, maybe you could get in a crime fiction like that. Maybe that's the avenue you get. Maybe they're totally not in that vein. So I, I, I personally, I don't know, I, but I, you know, I spend a lot of time trying to get my drinking buddies and the guys in my band to read novels. And then, and then you come to find that, you know, all your work on trying to get them to read novels and all they want to read is not fiction. So, but eventually you get, you get, you get to, to find out what kind of guys they are, but, but it takes longer than just like having a 10 minute conversation about bands. Because everybody knows about that. <laughs> Same thing with my old buddies. They saw you go, Claire. Well, just it's sort of funny. Like, I was just thinking about what you just said. Like, so many more guys are into non-fiction than fiction. You know, Guys want facts, women want truth. That's the bottom line. <laughs> <laughs> Guys want sex, women have a headache too. If I can put that. <laughs> that's maybe too. That's just my own personal experience. I don't know if I'm a female nonfiction writer. I don't know. I don't know. Do you guys have any other thoughts, further thoughts about that?
Well, I'm, I'm in the same boat as Willie, which is another great thing about meeting each other, you know what I mean? Like, both of us kind of grew up in this vacuum where we were reading books and writing, and like, all my old buddies, and they're great guys, they're smart, they're brilliant, they're funny, but they haven't read a novel since they read Gunter Grass in college, so they have no, I, I mean, I have no, I think some of them might read my books, but that isn't even, I didn't even require that. Go and get it, you know, I mean, it kind of folds back into Jim's question into how you, how, how do you, how do you make readers? And I think this. Do you know what I mean? I think this. Rather than talking at people, you just have a conversation. And like, I mean, literally, the way I've attacked it is just we both grew up in bands, so it's like when you're in a band, you just sort of like try to build an audience. You just show up at the same four clubs every night. You make your friends come over and over, and eventually, you know, you know, you start with one, you're up to two, then four and six. Pretty soon, you're up to eight, and you know, it may not get better than that. Uh, but like, I mean, really, just word of mouth, and just like, if you go into somebody's living room and drink their beer, like at a book club, those people will buy your book for life. They'll keep you in print, you know what I mean? Well, I can drink beer. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think you guys grew up with readers, too, because you I don't think you'd get out of a book club with your clothes on. I'll let you. You were charming as librarians before we started telling us about like really inspiring stories of what the library meant to you growing up, and I think that's a big part of it. We always talk about like you got to start young to be a reader and love reading. If you guys can share your story. I mean, I really think it. I really, I mean, I'm, maybe I, I'm pretty naive, but I really think all it takes is one really good book. No, if you can get if you can get the right book to the right person, it's just really hard. It's like uh, it's just really difficult. I mean, it, and you have to be. It's like chess moves to where you finally find that you think you find the right book for your right friend, and then you have to read it. It's like if you don't read this, I'm gonna really, I'm gonna hate you. I'm gonna not talk to you again. And then you see if they read it, and, and sometimes you you can break through that way. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the, the great thing uh, about getting a book published is, you know, I, I never did uh, meet any writers and I, you know, I became, you know, really interested in writing before the internet. So I never, you know, you never even read interviews with your favorite writers. They, they were these kind of mythic figures. You hear more about like some really bad punk rock band than one of the great, your great favorite writers. Um, and so for me, you know, meeting Johnny in a, a it's one of the luckier things ever happened to me because it's, I mean, the guy that, that likes books, but he's, he's just a working class guy that just loves books. Um, so on that, that front, uh, getting the book published is one of the luckiest things that ever happened to me because I don't feel like a freak because I can hang out there. At, uh, well, he is kind of a freak. So I'm still, no, dude, I, I totally still feel like a freak. But, um, and then as far as libraries, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I've, I've always been a huge fan and supporter of libraries. I think, uh, you know, you always walk into the library and you want to be better, a better person. There's a, there's a uh, feel when you walk into the library that means you want to better yourself. I mean, maybe you're just getting DVDs or, or whatever, but really, maybe I'm just sleeping in one of the computer cubby. Whatever the case. I always, every time I walk into the library, I always feel like it's, it's like my idea of a church. It's safe, it's, it's, it's all about learning, and it's quiet, and people are there to help you better yourself. And so I've always been a huge fan and supporter, and I, I do think... Well, you grew up poor too, like me. Growing up poor, there's this other thing that libraries do. They make you think that something matters. Do you know what I mean? It's the one, I grew up poor in an island full of rich people. And like the library was like, it's even Steven here, man. There's this world of knowledge and I can check out as many DVDs as you. I can read as many books as you. I'm as welcome as here as you. I have the same, like I don't have, my family doesn't have that consumer power. You know, Christmas isn't as rosy at my house or this or that. Or maybe I'm wearing those fucking hand-me-downs for my brothers who are like 13 years older. Thanks, Mom. You know what I mean? So, I mean, I'm so much younger than my older siblings that it's like not only are the hand-me-downs, they're like a decade out of style. Or like I bought, my mom bought me these uh, I thought slacks at the church rummage sale, but there was a little spaghetti stain right on the uh, right on the, where the, the little tag where the alligator is. The first day of third grade, my first year at that school after my sister died, my dad moved us up here and left us. I walk into class and the richest, preppiest kid goes, "Hey, man, I recognize those slacks you got them at the church rummage sale." You know what I mean? It was just like ah. You know what I mean? Let's try it. My mom's doing everything she can to give me the eyes on slack. She worked as the milk lady at the junior high. It was her first job, okay? Because she was very much a woman of her era. She's 81 now. 
and you know my dad was the breadwinner and she you know raised five kids without any help and like you know then he left and like my all my brothers and sisters just kind of scattered and uh, my mom was like got her first job at the milk lady but then she had to quit it because she didn't want to stigmatize me once I got into junior high you know what I mean she did everything for me but I don't know where I was going this I just had to give one to mom <laughs> but like, you know, I mean, the library. I mean, you know, that, that was a place where you would go where you would feel like, uh, and to this day, like, I'm always, like, I mean, when the ALA asked me to do something, I'm like, I'm all over that. Because, I mean, the library is a great evenizer, man. It, it, it opens all this knowledge and all these possibilities to people who don't have the resources to make that happen for themselves. And, I, I mean, I felt that as early as third grade. I mean, I, I felt like I'm on even ground here. I have the same currency as Steve Moen or Brad Myers or like all the rich kids I grew up with and Steve Moen ended up being really nice by the way. Um, he's an organic farmer now so that's a happy story. But, uh, I had currency and it was called a library card. Well, I mean, and I think, yeah, I mean, he, when you think about a library, for a lot of people it's the only kind of quiet place it might have. It might be the only place that has air conditioning in the summer and heat in the winter and and, and no one's expecting anything of you, but you can expect stuff of yourself. I mean, it's, I would, so libraries, uh, I think, even are, are as important or more important with the, the, the change of, you know, the, the computer era. Um, I, I think there's a tendency for people not to, to belittle the, the importance of a library because of the internet, and I think it's the opposite. I, I think it's needed even more. It's great. I mean, and this all ties into what I'm saying about class. Like, everybody's just going down. Do you know what I mean? Everybody that used to be middle class is like, so many people don't have the resources they used to have. Like, uh, the library just, because, you know, I mean, but taxes never go away, do they? And thank God for libraries and roads, you know, or otherwise I would just, you know, I don't know where I'm going with that. <laughs> I library and road, man. Well, I mean, I'm not happy about seeing my tax money go into a lot of stuff it goes into, but I'm always happy to see it going to libraries and roads, particularly Same. libraries. So any other questions? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to read this book, uh, this new book called MA versus NYC about the two Chad Harbach. Yeah, Chad Harbach. Uh, about the two big wormholes into being published as a, as a literary writer. And uh, one of the recurring themes, kind of starkly, but kind of not, is um, that this program fiction machine, this uh, professionalized fiction apparatus, has, has created this, uh, you know, thousands of what they call, uh, you know, minimalist, polished, uh, you know, kind of sad, Carver-esque fiction that, you know, the kind of you guys write, but they, they kind of professionally synthesize it through, you know, the eyes of starry eyed 22 year olds. I always tell Willie that he yeah. saved Carver for me because I mean, he's the one guy that came to Carver, like, honestly and said, man, somebody's <laughs> writing working class stories. Otherwise, everyone's taught him. You know what I mean? Right. Like, yeah. 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 But when I hear it through, I mean, AWP was in town uh, in Seattle last week, and, you know, when I, I, I dropped by for a little bit, and about 15 minutes was all I could stand, because it's always sort of sad, credulous people, you know, with these dreams but no real idea how to, you know, make their pretensions reality. And I mean, it's really, it's, how, how do you find a, a way through that when you tell people like that? I mean, it's really hard, really, when you when you think about uh, all these people, like, it's, you know, maybe the dot novel really is a dying art, right? I mean, we're talking about people having a hard time getting their friends to read, no one reads. I mean, I, I beg my girlfriend to read novels. Um, uh, and then you have a, an in industry pumping out like really ambitious novelists, right? Mm -hmm. um, um, so it is really tricky and, and weird. And, and, and you can view it as depressing uh, if you look at it. Um, I mean, me, I, I live in a false reality that way. I don't know, I don't want to know about that. I mean, I like Carver because of the stories I, I I'm, I, I, you know, he gets a lot of heat for the, for the stylistic thing of, of him. But when I first started reading him, I just read him for the, for the story, for the ideas of it. And I won't read him anymore because I don't want to think like that. That makes me feel like thinking as a kid um, and how I was as a kid. But the idea of MFAs, uh, I mean, it's, you're pumping out a ton of novels into a market you can't handle it and you're schooling them. And, and I mean, 
all, all you want from a novel is to feel less alone or feel part of something or be taken away or be moved by something. And, and the, the last thing you want to, when you're, what, if Johnny's writing a book and I'm looking over him and saying like, well, you know, I'm your boss and I don't really like that guy. You know, like maybe Ben shouldn't be, maybe Ben should be nicer or maybe Trevor uh, in, in his novel, maybe, maybe he should be, uh, you know, less witty and not so crass at times and maybe you should do this and that and you take Johnny out of it a little bit. Maybe you just take 20% of the guy out of it. Maybe not or maybe you save it. I don't know but it's an interesting thing to, to pump out a ton of writers in the a dime market and then instructing them on how to do their thing because art is always about a person's expression and then, and then the reason you like it. The reason a drunk guy talks about who's your duty in the corner is because <laughs> Those guys didn't know anything. They're just by themselves in Minneapolis. Well, they, the, the, the singer, the drummer was singing. You yeah. know what else? And you need to know. And he's saying, the drummer he's drummer singing a band. But he's saying, you know what I mean? But he's so saying, unless you're Don Hamlet, Bill Collins. But he's saying things that he wouldn't say uh, if someone was schooling. You know, he maybe he wouldn't have played. Maybe they would have tuned a little bit better, done a little bit different if somebody told him what to do. And maybe it's. The, it's better that no one told him what to do. I mean, if you told Flannery O'Connor, yeah, I know she went to uh, Iowa, but I mean, she was nuts, right? I mean, her stories are freaking mad and then funny and sad. And if you tried to harness that and tone it down, I mean, it wouldn't be as magical. So, and I'm not, I'm not sure MFA programs don't just like take 10 or 15, 20% off it. I don't know. I, I hear being really nice. I'm just gonna say AWP is the biggest fucking Ponzi scheme in the world. Is a whole ecosystem of like 60,000 teachers drawing salaries just so they can put a bunch of 19 year old kids $70,000 in debt with this idea that they're going to be an Ernest Hemingway and the reality is they're going to be writing shit for Slate for free online. I mean it's just, it, it's just, and, and I would go further, no academics in here, right? I didn't say this at AWP quite in the same words, but I am pretty vocal about it. I would say that teaching anybody anything about writing is a huge disservice. I mean, any, anything I teach you about writing, I'm doing you a disservice. I am one more obstacle keeping you from being a truly unique voice. I mean, you know, Dickens, Shakespeare, none of, none, of, none of the writers of the ages went to an MFA program, and I would go so far as to say no writer that ever went to an MFA program will ever be a writer of the ages, because he will never, or she, I should say she, really, I mean, because it's the more likely scenario, is ever going to... Uh, I, I just don't know. You just can't. You teach somebody something, you steal something from them. The only way to really learn something and be really original at it, I think, is just to run at it and fail. You know, and that means stacking up a lot of bad novels. But like, if I teach you something about dealing with um, dealing with third-person limited points of view, because I've written 13 novels and you've written zero, and maybe I can save you five years learning this lesson that I would have learned. I might keep you from really breaking a rule that could just blow open fiction. You know what I mean? I'm going to steer you away from... You have to break the rules. You have to be dangerous. And the only thing that's... In, like I, The thing I was saying about like why did it have to be written? Or did somebody just write it? There has to be danger on the page. There has to be risk. There has to be... I mean, a, a good novel has to just barely be able to sustain the force of its own invention. You have to feel the artist somewhere in there like taking the risk, but I don't want him beating me over the head, I want him to get out of the way, you know? I don't need William Faulkner going, this is me changing points of view. I need a, I need a writer actively like trying to push that envelope but really give the story to the reader where it belongs. Like when I read a book, I want it to be my narrative. I, I want the writer to get the fuck out of the way. It's like, Franzen, okay, I know you have some axes to grind with the left. That's awesome, but this is just a political point. And I'll say the same thing as Steinbeck, who we both love and idolized as a kid. Later Steinbeck work is just brutal. I mean, the difference between the greatness of rap, which took this great social problem and, and put it in, in human form of just the characters of the Joad family moving west. You read in Dubious Battle, which has all the same touch points, labor, uh, communism, all the same thing, but it's a political polemic and it's horrible and it sucks because it's just Steinbeck, Steinbeck, banging his socialist drum. I, I mean, this is subjective. I don't want that. I want, I want, it, I want it to be my work. I mean, in my opinion, uh, the, a cheaper MFA program would be just to find somebody that, job. No, that, someone that, that can 
guide you to the books you might like. You know, if you're a big fan of books, to meet somebody that, uh, like I met a, 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 a professor at, at University of Nevada, Reno, who, who just talked to me for 10 minutes and then said, you gotta read this, 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 and this. And that, that changed my life. And then I figured out, then, then you find out if you're, if you're just a fan or if you're silly enough uh, or foolish enough to try to, 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 to write yourself. Um, but I mean, I think really all you have to do is, is read the great books and you can learn everything you want to learn. Um, but the thing that I think the MFA, the thing we're missing out is like MFA and writing groups and stuff, what they do give you is friendship. And they give you uh, a, a comrade who, in a really lonely profession, gives you a friend. And that was something I never had. And I mean, getting to hang out with Johnny is really fun because I finally have somebody that's doing the same sort of stuff. I do and likes books, and so I mean, if you get that out of the MFA program, I don't know if that's worth eighty grand or or whatever it costs to go to a eight grand, like eight, forty eight, I mean, years. Eight. But but I mean that that the writers groups I think are, are are great as far as if if you're just a lonely person writing and and, you, and your husband or wife thinks you're a fucking maniac or or yelling at you like, well, why do you want to? Why do you want to sit in a room by yourself? Why do you want to starve us? We can be together and it's like sunny out and we can go to the beach and you're like, I really want to, I want to kill this guy in the next chapter. <laughs> uh, that, that whole thing, um, it is kind of, it is, it's frightening and uh, lonely and uh, people think you're nuts. And so I think writing groups can be really helpful on that, that front. It just, I think Johnny's really right. I think it's dangerous when people tell you how to, how to do something, especially, you know, always read somebody's work before, when they're telling you what to do. It's like if, if a guy's in like a bad, uh, uh, like Stone Temple Pilots cover band and he's telling you how to write songs, maybe you should listen. Uh, you know, maybe you should listen to somebody else. So I think you gotta be really choosy on who you listen to with advice to. And to use a musical analogy, it's just like, oh, okay, so the MFA program, say, I know what they read. I, 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 I mean, they read Dennis Johnson's Jesus is Son, which hit me like a lightning bolt, too. Uh, or, or Tim O'Brien's The Things They Carried With Them. Two amazing novelists by novelists who are breaking all the rules. I would liken this to, like, Bob Dylan and, and, and Neil Young. Amazing musicians that did these amazing things, but I think a lot of us can agree they're terrible influences. Because every time I'm walking down the market and I see a busker singing like Dylan or Neil Young, I want to take the fucking guitar and hit him over the head with it. It's because you're not Dylan and you're not Neil Young, and that's not your voice. You know what I mean? Dennis Johnson had that. Tim O'Brien has that. You can't teach that. You can teach the craft of it. You can teach the fishbowl. You can teach them how to withhold information and disseminate their information a certain way and give a story a certain art. But you're just taking all the blood out of it. All the shit they could learn on their own just fucking sorting rotten tomatoes and washing dishes and being in vain. Well, and it's also, I guess you could say, it's like a Berkeley school of music. You can teach a guy all the tricks and all the licks, but you can't teach him soul. Right, or some Mozart, guy. you know what I mean? Yeah, like some people have, or whatever. Yes, yeah, some people have soul and, and some don't, and some know how to uh, translate the soul into into the red word, and you just feel like, and then some people don't, no matter how hard they try. And uh, I don't think you can teach that, that kind of trick that makes somebody read a story and start crying, and then somebody else who might be better and smarter and uh, trickier, and, and, and you feel empty. I mean, that's just one of those things I don't know anybody knows. You wow me with your characters. Do you know what I mean? I read a million of about Paul. I'm you know, Paul Harding wins the Pulitzer. I read his book and it's like, wow, what a beautiful sentence. Oh my God, here comes another one. Oh my God, here's another one. Oh, we're talking about epilepsy now. It's a meditation on epilepsy. Okay, where were we again? Is this a story? But where you get me every time is just that I fucking care about your characters. And you're not trying to show off. You're just telling a fucking story, you know what I mean? And that's what I want, because then it becomes my story. You're getting out of your way. You're a perfect example of somebody who just gets out of their own way. You never try to wow your readers with the language itself. It's like the blood running through the story. It's like the, when you fall in love with an actress, you know, because I do, I, I'm a sucker, and I always fall in love with actresses in, in movies, and then when you see them acting, you're like, ah, oh, shit, they're actresses. <laughs> and then, then it's ruined. And or you need them and you go, oh, shit, they're actresses, which, you know. And then the same thing with the novel. When you, can, when you think of the writer, 
gets involved in the story, then it's ruined. For me, when I, when I think uh, of a writer uh, writing it, and then, um, uh, like, uh, you think, I was, at the worst part of me, they, they, were, they have a pipe and a turtleneck, and they're, like, looking over the sea, and you're like, fuck, oh, really? Like, or the easier? <laughs> no. But when, like, when, you know, that's a cool thing, like, when I read Johnny's books, I never think of Johnny. Because the, the stories, they, they're just good. And so I just get in. And then when people get too tricky, or they're, they're not quite tricky enough to be as tricky as they want to be, or they get too heavy-handed, then you think, you see the puppet guy, and, and you see the actress acting. And you remember you're reading the book instead of actually living the experience. And that ruins everything. So for me, my biggest goal is never to think about the writer at all. I never want to imagine the writer writing it. I just want to think this is really happening. I think we can do one more question. Sorry. John had one here a while ago, but maybe it's still more fun. No, I just was going to... Was it out of it? Is it? Was it about cycling? <laughs> no. But I think kind of John's talking about how cycling. I was thinking that, you know, so like, you know, um, Justin Bieber, just to pick somebody that I really don't like, but he's extremely popular. So... He looks there's... just like Hilary Swank, I think. <laughs> I can't tell them apart. Yeah, I mean, they're looking more and more alike. I mean, so there's this, uh, you know, this concept where, you know, we're talking about the death of the novel and all that, and how literary fiction is brewing in the novel. And, um, I might be paraphrasing a little bit. But, um, and so, it, you know, there's someone like Justin Bieber who, I would say, he's not full of great intellect and talent and, and uh, breaking the rules and telling us something new about ourselves, like maybe we would ask for in the great literature. Um, on the other hand, it's good for someone to, I, I think, this, what happens when you go to Berkeley or Juilliard or some F MFA program, I'm not saying they're all fantastic, but I'm saying what happens is we as readers go, oh yeah, Justin Bieber, I'm not into it. I mean, whatever, he does what he does, but I'm not into it. We can figure that out. We can figure out what we like. But what they do spit out is they spit out people who have learned a craft that helps them to use the originality in their brain in a, maybe in a new and in a moving way. And it, it, many, a lot of it maybe is crap, but some of it's good. And so my, my Yeah, question no, I, is, I agree. I mean, I, I was being pretty harsh. I mean, I'm not saying that, I, I, but I still, I was, I still think it's a bad idea. I mean, I, there's a lot of great writers that come out of Iowa. I mean, I mean, just I was just kind of being. Devil. I mean, so is it a bad idea to go to learn how to paint? I, mean, um, I don't know. Okay, well, I'll use an example as uh, my roommate in 1991, a guy named Paulo Tong, who is uh, I think he was this uh, uh, he was this Chinese American kid who eventually decided that he wanted to be black. It wasn't enough to be Chinese American, and actually he came from money, and he, he was doing pretty good. He was a Trustafarian. But like he had a real yen for painting when he just painted in his own stuff. Like he painted me. It's still in my office. Uh, one of my favorite writers, John Fante. Uh, he painted a portrait of John Fante, and it still hangs in my office. And it was one of his first paintings, and it's brilliant. And then he went to art school, and then all of a sudden he was explaining his paintings to me. And it's like it would be this like ugly black background with a green noose and some guy hanging by it and it was just not attractive to look at but I wasn't good enough to get it because well you don't get it because you don't know I'm playing off this and this here and you have to understand art history and I'm like but that's now I look at art you know what I mean I want to respond to it I'm going to like it or I'm not going to like it if there's subtext there for me to see I'm going to find it for myself I don't want you as the arbiter and so like I would say it was terrible for him I say I, I saw a painter with great promise and then I saw this guy just being so technical and so aware of the history and the canon that um, it made his painting horrible. In fact, what happened was, I, I just kind of, we had a warehouse and so I can't draw, I can't illustrate, but I started doing this stuff with silhouettes. I'm not a painter, I'm like 20 at the time. So I started doing stuff with light and silhouettes and just painting black and white latex on beaver board. To, to, and I was doing this to make, because it was a big warehouse, nobody had a room. So I had to do this to make my writing office. And so he sent his pictures in to his, he was, to his summer teacher. He was supposed to work on this body of work and he was doing all these technical paintings, all the things he learned. And he sent a picture in the background were my two black and white latex. And, like, and he had all his photos in the foreground. And the only thing the teacher said was like, tell me about this black and white. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's like he wrote this whole, you know what I mean? And, and that just says it. Even the teacher 
whose job it is at that point because probably they couldn't make it as a painter themselves possibly or maybe they just appreciate they can't. I'm not trying to I'm not trying to fucking bust the balls of teachers. I love teachers. They've saved my life. I just think that craft is one thing and magic on the page is another thing. Do you know what I mean? I mean all the craft in the world doesn't quite make for magic Absolutely. on the page. I'm, 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 I'm saying though, when you get both, that's special. Yeah, but I mean the that's best. Thing, it is the best thing. It's rare. Like it's a, rare. Yeah. Like an MFA thing, I think the best thing you could do is, is give a break to like a really talented person who can be around people. They maybe they 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 get a couple years free to write a novel. Maybe uh, they uh, get to be around certain people that help them out through rough times, or they find avenues like, hey, you don't need to get a job at the Red Lobster. There's this fellowship. Yeah. I think that kind of stuff and the friendship really will make make the difference or, or or being inspired to be around great writers. Maybe maybe the point is not to learn anything from a great writer, but just to be to, to just to be in a conversation or having a teacher. You might not agree with a great writer that yeah. it's a teacher, but you're just seeing him, you're like, that guy's kind of a jackass. <laughs> and he's a great writer. Maybe maybe I, I can be a great writer too. I mean maybe there are good things about it, but but I think it's 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 always scary when when a, there's an industry pumping out uh, writers that, that there's no voice for. I, mean, I think that's always it's like pumping out rock bands that that aren't organic. I don't know. I don't. I don't know. It's interesting. I think the smaller the MFA program, the bigger the the lesser the danger too. I mean, the, the, like Iowa is very competitive. I mean, having a bunch of friends that went to Iowa is like my classmates hated me. I had no fellowship with them. It was kind of like we people got together in a room and eviscerated each other's story. It was like a shark pit. It was like competitive. But then then I've hung out with like I've gone to like uh, Moscow, Idaho, and uh, hung out like basically just went drinking with the MFA students till three in the morning and smoked pot in the alley with them and just talked about the love of books. And that was amazing. That was amazing. But there was nobody really indoctrinating there at that level. There's just I think that like the major MFA programs are a little different than like I mean I think the least the less reputable the MFA program is, the less dangerous it is, actually. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the competitiveness and the little I've known about that world, that, like, like, the last thing you want to be around is a bunch of really smart people that are criticizing uh, uh, stories. I mean, you should all be fans of the story, right? You're all fans of the novel, so it's always scary when people have their daggers out and they're, like, crucifying each other when really, you're just, you want to find a novel that moves you makes you feel less alone, that uh, makes you laugh. I mean, I mean, the idea to be a, a fan of the, of the novel is just to find the one that's going to blow your mind and be your pal. And give you, so you give 10 of them for Christmas presents, you know, that sort of stuff. And I think, I think sometimes in those NFA programs that I've seen, um, I mean, they, they've lost track of that. It's like they just, they've lost the love of it. And I think a lot of times they don't even like the novel. It's, it's just, they like writing, but they're not in love with the novel. And I think that's always scary. If you ever meet low residency offers for both of us. <laughs> yeah, try to get it. I don't care. I mean, you know what I mean? And just like. <laughs> Hi, Eric. You're like Eric, he's a horseman. All right, Eric. You guys want to hang out and sign some books? Oh, another question. Yeah, sure. One more. <clears throat> I've read Lulu and Caregiving. Love, love them both. Really enjoyed Lost myself in them. So thank you. Several scenes in Caregiving, I, I kept thinking the Coen brothers are going to make a movie of this. So <laughs> hey, you ever think, what would you think if, if the idea of one of your work, either of your works, well, well Willie's movie, first of all, my movie starts shooting June 2nd of that book, okay. so it's a go. And Willie, I, went, I was at the Portland premiere with him, and it was a great thrill to be with him to watch The Motel Life uh, with um, uh, uh, Stephen Dorff and, and the kid I love that's like uh, uh, Emil Hirsch. Emil Hirsch. Oh, okay. And it was really great because it brought the book. It was like one of the better literal, you know, oftentimes with an adaptation, I want to see the filmmaker take some chances. They're different things. you got an hour and a half to tell the story instead of 200 pages. But what I liked about Willie's film in particular was that I thought it was really true to the book. And the book was a quiet book, you know what I mean? So it worked. I think what I'm dealing with a different beast with this because like in an hour and a half we're, they're going to have to start the road trip almost right away and it's going to be different. I'm kind of like, 
this is great, it puts some bread on my family's table, but it's kind of irritating actually. Because <laughs> it's like, everyone's like, oh, well, here's going to be a movie. And I'm like, well, yeah, it was also that fucking book I almost killed myself writing. You know what I mean? Nobody, you know, like, it's not enough that it's a book. You know what I mean? In a weird way, like, I like cinema. Willie and I, you know, like, when we're on tour, we just, like, constantly go back and forth because Netflix streams shit. So, like, we have to be each other's, like, filter. Like, have you found anything good lately? And so we'll go back and forth with, like, good stuff. But, like, a film has never changed my life. I can name 20 books that have changed my life. And so, like, uh, I'm excited. It's neat. I kind of like, uh, I, I really should speak to this, too, because it's actually happened. I kind of know what I'm into with my guy, and I like it. He's taken a lot of license with the script. He was very respectful and was worried what I would think. And I'm like, dude, this is your, this is yours now. I mean, once you option it, this is yours. Yeah, I mean, I'll get a credit, and that's fine. But I want you, whatever inspired you about it, you do what you want to do with it and make it your thing. I always like, and we've talked about this, we've, neither of us liked that, 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 that uh, uh, Altman took the middle class out of Carver, but I did like that Robert Altman in Shortcuts took Carver's stories and, and added Robert Altman. I thought it made it a cool collaboration. And so I want to see that with mine. That's fine. I think it's going to be a really cool movie. If they, I mean, if they if they do half things right, I think it'll be his book will be a really amazing movie. So I'm I'm really excited. I think I'm more excited uh, about the movie than he is. Uh, so I hope to. Well, I'm sure I was more excited about yours than mine. Yeah. It's just an ambivalent feeling. Like what I liked about yours is that it was actually very true to the book. But that's because it, you can't just do that with every book. It depends. That was a quiet book about two brothers at work. They could actually get most of the stuff in there. You know what I mean? They didn't have to get 30 years of history in it. You know? True, true. Any more questions? Well, you guys, thank you so much. Thank you.